Hello again. As you know, I am Eli, the computer guy. Today, we are going to be doing an interview with Nate Houghton, director of Next Gen Venture Partners. Basically, this is a venture capital firm in the Washington, D.C. area. I wanted to have him on so we can talk about fundraising for your startup company. Again, in this modern world of tech businesses and tech startups, everybody's worried about Ruby versus PHP, AWS versus Azure. But so many times, people forget forget, um, hey, how are you going to pay the utility bills? Hey, you know all those employees you want? Yeah, they, they need to have things like workman's comp paid for. How are you going to do that? And so one of the ways that you can do that with a startup company is you bring in investment. So normally when you're going to invest in your startup company, uh, you're the first person to invest. You're the first person to write checks basically to yourself. And then you go to what's called the friends and family round. Basically, you go to your grandma and your grandpa and your parents and say, please, please, I know my dog dating app will take over the world. And basically, you go from there to angel funders. So angel funders, uh, they are... Um they are the people that actually invest in you out of their own bank accounts. So basically, you go to a high net worth individual, a rich person, a wealthy person, and say, hey, I think my dog dating app will take over the world. If you invest $100,000 in me right now, it'll be worth billions in the future. And basically, after you then get through the angel funders and you're trying to get more money, you're trying to get half a million, a million, five million, ten million, essentially amounts of money that individual people People can't write checks for that is when you go for to the venture capitalists so that's why we're going to be talking with Nate Houghton today learning more about venture capitalism especially here in the Washington DC area and I think it's a good interview I think it was a good interview but of course but of course before we talk to Nate I have to talk about my sponsors because Eli the computer guy don't have no angel funders or or venture capitalists or, or anything else <laughs> I pay the bills the good old fashioned way. So I got to talk about the sponsors for a minute and then we will dive into the interview. So we have Veeam, V E E A M, free backup of PCs, VMs, and Linux, all at Veeam.com. Dev Mountain, Dev Mountain is a 12 week web development, iOS, and UX design boot camp intended to get you a full time job in the industry. Learn to code at DevMountain.com. INE, INE specializes in network training with hands on labs, on site boot camps, and a focus on delivering the best in online networking courses. INE.com. Schooly Mitchell. Schooly Mitchell's purpose is to increase clients' profit by reducing telecom cost using software and processes at no risk. We only share savings. SchoolyMitchell.com. Plixer. With scrutinizer and flow data, users can determine what traffic is on the network, who is originating the traffic, and who is receiving it. Plixer.com. And finally, Gilware Data Recovery. Gilware's partner programs help computer repair and IT professionals make money by offering data recovery services to their customers. Learn more at Gilware.com. As I say, I do not care if you thumb up, thumb down, leave a comment, or subscribe to the channel, but if you could click on the links below, that would be very helpful. And also, we do have sponsorship slots available, and we give you good click-through. I get a good click-through rate. So if you're interested, make sure to email me about sponsorships. And with that, let's dive into this interview. I think there's a lot of interesting things you can learn here. So here we are with Nate Houghton. Uh, director at Next Gen Venture Partners, a venture capital firm. And so I want to talk with him today to talk about the world of venture capital and how you might try to go about getting money for your startup company. So that's that's a big thing nowadays. Everybody everybody talks about like if you start a startup, like money just gets thrown at you. <laughs> and then you talk to startup founders and they're all like, no, 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 not it's quite. not that easy. <laughs> yeah. So Great. thank Thanks you. for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So I want to talk with you today. So then, so when we talk about a venture capital firm, because like whenever we're talking about money, we hear about we hear about banks, obviously, but there's debt equity or there's there's debt. What is it? Debt equity? Yeah. Where there's debt financing, there's yep. equity financing. You've got angel funders. You've got venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is a venture capital firm or venture capitalist? Yeah, so in, in the grand scheme of things, a, a venture capital firm is a very specific kind of private equity firm. Okay. So we invest money on behalf of folks who are, are looking to grow their wealth, just like any investment manager would. Okay. Um, the difference is that we exclusively look at private firms, like private equity, okay. and us specifically, we, we look at, at startup firms. So venture capital is one of the riskier forms of capital that you can put to work yeah. um, should you be looking to invest, whether it be your personal wealth or an endowment, whatever the case may be. Um, 
we our, our particular kind of flavor of venture capital like a lot of vc firms is is technology okay um and in many of the vc firms that have sprung up recently focused on that on that space it's a particularly attractive kind of financing for startup companies okay. um, because it is equity financing, yeah. uh, which means that you you know you don't have to uh, to deal with debt um, from from a bank. Yeah. Uh, obviously, these companies are frankly a little bit more risky than banks are typically willing to deal with, yeah. um, and so we are definitely out on the leading edge of some companies that we expect in most cases to fail, um, <laughs> but we expect that when they succeed, they will really, really, really succeed. Um, and I guess to answer another part of your question, angel investors uh, look at typically the same kinds of companies as us, yeah. generally a little bit earlier in their life cycle than we do, okay. um, just because it's it's a little bit easier to put your own money at risk than to put somebody else's money at risk. And so I think I think you end up you know using a network of angels like we do to de-risk investments and find the startups we should be looking at. Interesting. So then, where when you talk about the life cycle, then when when I don't know, like how long would a startup be around or how big would a startup be before they would look at you or before you would look at them, I guess? Yeah, it's actually a much more interesting question than you'd think, um, yeah. because like this is this is something that's changed significantly, really even over the past like year or so. Okay. Um, and so it used to be the case that you you might start off with friends and family money or maybe some of your own personal money. You you then would maybe raise some money from angels, and then you you do what's called kind of a seed round of funding. Yeah. Um, the traditional seed round of funding was typically a million dollar round. That's kind of your classical seed round. Yeah. Uh, the company might be worth say two or three million before the money, and then we put in our additional million dollars. Uh, what's happened recently is that it's become very, very inexpensive to start a company. Um, anyone can really do that. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's great. I think that's awesome for entrepreneurship, and it means that you know we have more people who are able to um, start their own businesses than ever before. Yeah. The problem is it's harder for people like us to tell which of these businesses are actually good. Um, and yeah. so that means that what's ended up happening you know, I think the backlash to that is that sort of seed stage investors are moving later and later in the process. Hmm. And so you're seeing seed stage rounds uh, that are about the size that Series A rounds sort of used to be um, maybe a few years ago. Okay. Uh, and you see companies raising uh, two or even three seed stage rounds before moving on to their Series A. Um, so it's certainly moved the goalposts a little bit. The short answer to your question is it depends on the industry for us in terms of what we're willing to look for. It also depends on whether the founder has done this before. Okay. Um, we're going to see need to see a lot more proof for a first-time founder yeah. uh, than we will for someone who has in the past. Um, but generally, the checks that we write are typically in the neighborhood of 500000 okay. Um And so we would be one of the investors in a round that is maybe two, three, four million dollars in total. Yeah. Uh, and we generally have a pretty hard time writing our first check if the valuation for the company is above $10 million. Um, so those are kind of our guidelines. Okay. We do continue to invest in the company in their subsequent rounds. And so a lot of the companies we've invested in have matured significantly, and we're really happy to see that. Yeah. Um, but usually where we like to get in for, for our yield and to kind of you know, fulfill the promise that we have to our investors is pretty early. So then that's the interesting thing like with valuation. Because when mm -hmm. I first heard of valuation years ago, I thought, I thought there was some big, awesome math equation. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of people kind of pull it out of their 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 butt. Like, how do you yeah. how do you figure out a value? Ten million or one million? How do you figure that out? The the best quote on valuation that I've ever heard is, "Your valuation is whatever an investor will give you." <laughs> and so, like, <laughs> it, it's it's a marketplace and it's very dynamic. Yeah. Um, I'm not particularly good at math, which means that I'd probably be pretty bad at almost all kinds of finance. Yeah, um, the okay. only kind that I'm really in any way equipped to deal with is this. Yeah. Um, the, the the other short answer I think is is there are comparables out there. So like okay. you see enough of these and you kind of just get a feel for it. Okay. Um, I, I, there's 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 certainly rules of thumb, uh, and I think that we've probably more often than anything else walked away from an investment not because we don't like the entrepreneur, or don't think it's a good idea, but because the valuation just doesn't make sense for us. Because at the end of the day, if 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 we're not getting as big a chunk of the company as we need yeah. for our economics to work, it doesn't really matter how good. The idea is it's just never the math will never work out for us unless it literally becomes Uber. Right. And so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I know that's it's a bit of a long winded answer. I think that uh, there is no equation yeah, um, yeah. And, and anyone who kind of tries to tell you that they can piece together, you know, two points for a great founder and three points for location. I, I don't really buy much of that. I think evaluation is, is whatever you can get. Um, <laughs> And in a lot of cases, it's sort of moving throughout the negotiation where it was one thing and then all of a sudden there's a new investor who shows up with something else and, and we're playing under different rules. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it certainly varies, but, but generally 
Um, I guess the, the one thing I would add, and I think I, I mentioned this in, in sort of the forum where we, we last spoke, was I think maybe one of the bigger mistakes that first-time entrepreneurs especially can make, and, and one that I made yeah. um, many times, is to, to assume that a higher valuation is always better. Um, okay. That's actually not the case. Uh, in fact, usually, you know, there's there's a good valuation for your company, yeah. um, and even more than that, there's the right investors and the right terms for your company. So I think looking at, at the term sheet holistically, in addition to just the valuation, is something that not a lot of entrepreneurs, not enough entrepreneurs really do. So then, because you say the, the enough of the company, so how much of the company are you trying to get? Uh, our our rule of thumb is uh, is is like ten percent. Is ten percent um, okay. that that'll vary firm by firm. We are on our first uh, uh, first go around with this whole thing, yeah. so okay. um, we don't have as much cash to play with as as most VCs. Yeah. Um, uh, some might actually call us a micro VC, of which there there are quite a number, and we're we're really excited about what we've been able to raise, but we can't put the same kind of capital to work. And so all of that is to say that, um, you know, we we have that rule of thumb that we're looking for ten percent. I know VCs that will jump in later and will look for twenty. Okay. Um, I know VCs that are happy with five. There are angel investors and even some very small VCs that might be happy with one. Um, and that's you know I shouldn't act like we always get what we want either. I think like generally we're we're dealing with entrepreneurs who have options. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a rule of thumb or a target for us, but, um, you know, it's, it's going to change depending on what, what's on the table. So do you, do the startups have to work? Like one of the things I was surprised about is cause we, we met for anybody out there is at the ask a VC event and some of the VCs up there were, were a little more bloodthirsty than even I was kind of used to. And like mm-hmm. one of the pers- people I think said like that they would take like 70% of the company if they could get a hold of it. Mm-hmm. Which seemed odd to me because I had heard in the past where it's any kind of VC is that they don't want to take too much because then you don't have anything to sell in the future to keep yourself going. Mm-hmm. Um, is that something to worry about? Are VCs out there trying to get 70% of companies? I mean, uh, Some of them. And I, I would yeah. say that I, I think I think the firm that, that you're referring to is a lot later than we were, um, mm-hmm. which means that like at the point that they're probably more of what we would call kind of a growth stage VC. Yeah. Um, so their economics work out a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. They're they're going to maybe see a company, if they're lucky, like double in value between the time where they invest and the time where they have an exit, which means they need a lot of that. Huh, um, okay. We're hoping for it to go like 10, 20, 25, 50 times the value, which means we're pretty pleased with 10% um, <laughs> okay. of, of that kind of appreciation. So, yeah. uh, so I, I don't know if it's necessarily something to worry about. I think that generally I found it to be one of the the spaces of the economy where people are tremendously helpful. I think to your point, yeah. early stage VCs, seed stage VCs like us certainly understand that you know it's not great if we own the whole company and then you have this principal agent problem where your entrepreneurs aren't working as hard as you want them to. Yeah. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you know, things tend to shake out to a place where people are are generally happy. Okay. Um, and and so so I think I think that's a bit of a different just a different kind of transaction that that isn't certainly standard for. Um, the stage at which we're, we're investing. So then with these startup founders, because you're like, well, you're kind of a micro VC. And they're kind of a growth stage VC. So I say, like, when somebody like me walks in, it's just VC. Mm-hmm. Like, how do, you, how do you know what the hell any of you people are? Like, how do yeah, you figure that yeah. out? <laughs> um, you can look at, uh, I think where to start is, is AngelList and Crunchbase. Okay. Um, because we and we we are pretty vigilant about keeping our our investments updated because we have a vested interest in having the right entrepreneurs find us too. Like we want transparency and visibility. We, we want you to be able to find us. So yeah. I say that because you'll be able to see sort of how much that you've invested um, in what types of companies. Maybe more importantly, so like what's what's our style or what's our flavor? Like we have a couple themes, like ways that we look at the world that might fit with the company you're starting or might not. Okay. Um, you know, I think I think fairly obviously, like we're we're looking at technology firms, and so you know you should you should identify VCs that look or that invest in technology firms. Um, I think that I guess the piece of advice I would give you is that the very best way to find us and the very best way to pitch us yeah. is to find someone that we know okay. who you also know, um, and you know identify a way to get to us like that. Yeah. Um, especially if it's someone who we've co-invested with, right. or even better, someone who we have invested in, um, another entrepreneur who you might know. So uh, entrepreneur friends are, are, are a very useful resource, maybe the most useful resource that an entrepreneur has. And, and I think like developing your pipeline or developing your list that way is pretty key. Now, that's one interesting thing, because everybody talks about that. 
But like when you walk into the, let's say you have the the great idea for the next dog dating app, mm. but that doesn't mean necessarily mean you have any kind of Rolodex or you don't know anybody. Like how how do you how do you create that pipeline? How do you actually meet anybody? Yeah, I, I think I think that the first the first step is actually maybe a little bit different. Like, and, and this goes back to what I mentioned about the seed stage moving. If you have that great idea. I, yeah. It's not that I don't believe that it's a great idea as a VC. It's that I know that I don't know. (laughs) And so in order for me to know, I need to see some traction. I need to see some, some, you know, I need to see a certain number of dogs on the app. Um, and, and I think like whatever it is that you're, that you're creating, especially with how easy it is to start a company today, um, relatively speaking, (laughs) it's still pretty hard. Um, but relatively speaking, it's it's much easier and cheaper. Like we, we want to see that you can get to a certain point where, you know, you're actually making some money. Um, and so whatever it is, like I, we're, we're not really going to talk to anyone who isn't booking uh, revenue and, and a good deal of revenue at this point. I think that if you really do need some cash to get it off the ground, like you should probably be looking for kind of friends and family sort of stuff, which is fine. And like we expect that we fully expect, I think almost every entrepreneur we've invested in has used some of her, his personal capital or family's capital to, to get going. Um, but it's, it's amazing sort of what you can sell today, um, you know, without a lot of VC funding. And and so by the time, I guess all that is to say that by the time you would be seeking us out or the time you would be looking for us, we probably would have found you. Um, and that's, that's probably the best thing because, you know, you want us calling you and not the other way around. Okay. So I I guess that that's one of the things, because like I've been following this for a few years and I swear, I was in one of these meetings once, and the person was like, literally, don't even have an executive statement. Like, a business plan is a black mark. An executive statement, I'm, it's mm-hmm. fishy about. Like, like they were like literally talking. If you had anything more than something scribbled on the back of a napkin, that, that was a black mark. Mm-hmm. Do you need revenue now in order to get investment, or are they still giving money to crap scribbled on the back of napkins? I, I mean, I can't speak for other firms. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Like, we, we certainly want to see some some social proof, and and generally, the best way to do that is like, are you actually making money? Okay. All of that said, like, we've invested in back of napkin ideas. So oh, like, you know, okay. th- this will happen, and and generally, that that'll be the case if someone, you know, has has done something amazing already, and we know that they know more about this than we do. Yeah. Um, so if you started an ed tech startup and you exited for you know, $500 million and now you're starting another ed tech startup. Yeah. Like we're probably interested. <laughs> like yeah. that's, that's pretty much all we need to know. Yeah. Um, if you're not though, if you're, if you're like I was with my last company and, and you know, you're, you don't have any background in this and you're not technical and like you have no idea what you're doing, you're probably going to need to make some money first. And that's, that's why I ended up failing yeah. um, and ended up here at a, as a VC anyway. So I think, uh, I think, I think like it's important to know how you'll be perceived in the market and, and yeah, there's dumb money out there um, that you can certainly find, but it's not as good for you, obviously, as, as good investors who are looking for that proof. Okay. Like when you talk about revenue, again, eh, approximate, squishy, like about, about what, how much revenue would you, would you say, lay back, you know, whatever, throw mm-hmm. something out there. I mean, if you if you're if you're really doing a dog dating app, we yeah. probably don't actually need any revenue. We just want to see crazy user growth. Um, okay. That's just as good. If you're doing kind of a business to business SaaS company, um, and your model is uh, monthly recurring revenue, yeah. like we're probably going to need to see something close to or above like fifty thousand a month, which is a lot of revenue. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and and you know that's just because of kind of how you're going to end up making money. If you have a marketplace, like the m- number that we might be looking at, will probably be. Not even necessarily how much money you're making, but how much transaction or how many transactions are happening over your market. Okay. Um, so all of that is to say that the most important thing is to know your business model and understand sort of what social proof would exist within that business model. Um, so it's like for, for this type of business, I could explain to you that this is how we're making money, yeah. um, which means that this is pretty good or this is not pretty good. Um, and the final piece is like... I, and I say this, you know, I, I've, I've been sort of saying this a, a little bit since I started working in VC. I, I don't think, I think there's amazing companies that are not good VC companies. Um, and I think a lot of them are the kind of companies that can have pretty impressive revenue, and even profit numbers without us. Uh, and, you know, so you should think hard before you kind of go and talk to us about whether you really want to want to deal with us or not um, <laughs> right. and whether it's worth your time. So, uh, so anyway, I think, I think that it will certainly vary by business model, but, um, really outside of kind of monthly recurring SaaS revenue, it's hard to pin it on something specific. Okay. So then that brings up an interesting question that, because I hear a lot of investors say that, is that they say like, sometimes you probably don't want to deal with me. 
<laughs> like, yeah. I hear investors say, they'll be like, look, I'm an asshole. Like, that's how it is. <laughs> so when you invest, so you put in 500000 or more into a company, other mm-hmm. than the equity, what do you actually get out of that? Because you talk about, like, board seats. You talk about management. Um, like, what – on a day-to-day or a week-to-week basis, how is a founder have to, I'm going to have to deal with you? Yeah, and, and this is sort of the funny part. Like, I, I'm actually not really even an investor. Um, so I, I don't sit on our investment team. I, I, uh, I actually run our team that does what we call portfolio support. Um, and so the founder is dealing with me more than anybody else. Um, and, and I like to make that very positive. Like I, I mentioned, this is my first time at a VC. I, I have a background in, in startups before this. Um, some successful and some not so successful. Uh, and I think that gives me a sense of what it is that we should actually be talking to founders about. Okay. Our specialty here is is business development. Um, we have a network of about 600 venture partners. Okay. Uh, they live across the country. They are founders in some cases themselves. They are technology executives. They are tremendously helpful people for connections. Uh, okay. And so we use them to work through sales pipelines on behalf of our portfolio companies. Yeah. Um, in our case, I'm actually on the phone with prospective customers trying to make connections for the founders. And I think for us, that's that's a big differentiator where we're actually going to work on their behalf. Okay. Um, the, uh, a few other things, I mean, we'll help with hiring. Um, if they're looking to raise another round and they'd like a connection to you know, a Bessemer or a Google Ventures, a really cool fund like that, we can, we can help facilitate that. Okay. Um, so generally, we, we want all of our interactions to be, to be very helpful. And, and I think we, you know, we're tracking things like NPS scores to, to make sure that they are. Um, but uh, I've, I've had amazing investors. I've had not so amazing investors. I think in, in my experience, I'd say, you know, you want people who are going to be willing to offer these connections and actually go to work for you because yeah. their, their capital is a risk. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not it's not that you don't want investors to ask tough questions. You absolutely do. Um, they need to understand your business and they need to understand your strategy towards it such that they give you the space and the time and the patience that you need to build it. Uh, so I, w- I would make sure, I guess, that the incentives um, and even the timeline are, are aligned with every investor that you have. OK, so how like. Could you cause a problem? Let's say I have my dog dating app, and then I realize, no, no, man, the real valuable niche is lizards. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go into lizards dating. Like, could you, could could the VC screw that up? Like, if I decided to pivot to lizard dating or whatever, would there be a problem there? Or would it just be arguments? Or is it, eh? I, I mean, generally for something like that, you probably know more about dogs and lizards than I do. And my assumption <laughs> is that, you know, I'll, I'll trust your pivot and how can we help? Okay. Um, I, you know, but, but that's probably a pretty good litmus test of like, would this be a helpful investor? Um, and I think you, you probably want investors who are like, cool. Like, can you explain your reasoning to me? Obviously I want to hear why, yeah. um, assuming it makes sense and we're both, you know, speaking logically about the same thing, then let us know what we can do to help make that change. Um, and pivots are part of the game. We totally understand it and we're happy to, to be part of that, but not all investors do. Um, and I think maybe, you know, when you think about VC in general as an asset class, or, or I should say VC in general as, as a source of capital for an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, that's maybe the best thing is that we tend to know sort of how this works a little bit yeah. um, in, in the sense that we're not going to be too peeved or, or, or kind of thrown off if you decide to pivot like that. Okay. And then that was another interesting thing at the Ask a VC event is – Somebody was really discouraging um, the hiring of advisors, which was kind of odd because I've been doing tech, not not startup, but tech business for a long time. And mm-hmm. I have to say, if I was going to do startup world, there's so much of this weird, squishy crap. I mean, I'd, I'd drop a few thousand dollars on an advisor to help me out. But, mm-hmm. it seemed, but people said that, like, if you have to hire an advisor to help you through the process, it only shows that you're not capable of getting through the process. Like, how do you feel about somebody hiring an advisor to try to try to walk through all this stuff um i think we'd probably have some questions about why it's the best way to solve that problem um however i could certainly see a scenario where we're bringing an advisor on might might be the best way to get at something in particular you know so if if it's something where you don't want to hire a full-time employee um there are arguments to be made that that if it's not core to your business model yeah i think it could be someone that you bring on um i'd say anytime i've hired advisors I've, i've sort of hired them with equity uh and and i think maybe 
some of the hesitancy there is, is around like, do you want to give up cash? But at the same time, like if you're going to bring someone on in any capacity and they're going to have a piece of your company or money from you, like is, is the value, is the ROI there? Is the value really there? So I don't know that we would have a hard and fast rule, but we probably have some questions as to why you don't just want to hire an employee um, right. instead of an advisor. Or maybe it's something that we could do for free. Um, so that's, that's the kind of stuff that I think is in, in advice in and of itself is fairly cheap. Yeah. Um, and, and there is a time cost to it. Like the worst thing for an entrepreneur is just a bunch of people giving you advice again and again and again that yeah. you can't make actionable. Like I think that you basically have two jobs. Like you're supposed to hire great people and not run out of money. Um, yeah. And if you can do both of those things as a founder, you're doing fine. So everything that you do should be focused on those things. And some advice will help be helpful with that. But, but you know, somebody's just connecting with all kinds of people is, is not always the most helpful. So then, so when we talk about just out of curiosity with uh, venture partners, are you, is it like an LLC? Are you an S corp? Are you like, what, what kind of company is, is a venture capitalist company? Are you? Uh, it, 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 yeah, <laughs> no, it varies. I think, I think the traditional structure, the traditional structure is that you, you set up as a fund with, with partners. Um, okay. and, uh, and then, you know, you have your general partners who are in charge of the firm and your limited partners who give their capital. Okay. Um, uh, the way that we're structured is a little bit different. Um, so we, we actually are an operating company, um, and that's that's kind of how we're put together. Uh, and and then this network of, of venture partners, actually they all pay a membership fee to be part of our um, of our network. Uh, that gives them the right to co-invest with us. And so whenever it is that we make an investment, we take um, we take cash from from our own cash, our own fund, yeah. uh, and then we uh, take checks from the venture partners themselves and create one special purpose vehicle for that investment. Um, so we're doing that in every case for every investment that we make. Um, so we're a little bit odd, I think, yeah. you know, a little bit, a little bit editorializing. Like I, I think this is actually kind of a cool model to do this, and we found that it's it's an interesting way to have access to talent um, and access to uh, connections that we as maybe an eight person firm would have a hard time doing. So um, I think there's something to it. And, and certainly like we're, we're certainly sorting out exactly what the very best way to use this network is, but it's a tremendously powerful tool to find deals and to help the companies we've invested in. Okay. Um, and so, so I think that thinking sort of innovatively about how to structure the model is, is something that's happening more and more in VC. So, so, so those 600, the, uh, the, the, your network, yeah. they actually pay a membership fee and then if something interesting to, is there to invest in, they then invest in that too? That's correct. And, and when they invest there, they don't have to pay carry. So they don't, they don't have to, on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, pay us for the right to invest in our companies. Um, okay. So it's, it, it ends up being a, a really good deal um, yeah. if, you're, if you're someone who's you know, sort of interested in getting some exposure to venture capital and having, and not to mention a really cool network of people to help with your company or, yeah. or jobs that you, that you need to find. Um, uh, so it's, it's been tremendously interesting. I think very popular as it's grown over the last few years, but, uh, but that's, yeah, that's how we're structured. Can I ask how much that costs approximately? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the annual fee is, is a thousand dollars. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not very burdensome at all. It's, it's really <laughs> just kind of to cover administration and make sure that we can keep the, the, the lights on here. Interest. Now, with that, like, how do you, how do you find the, those investors? Because one of the things that I found really odd is, like I say, I have a number of different uniforms or whatever, and whenever I try to talk with VCs, like one of the questions I always ask them is, "How the hell do I give you money?" Mm -hmm. And they would they would just never answer that. Like, it was so funny because it would be like, "I can actually write a check," and like, I'm actually yeah. trying to figure this out, and that would be like the one thing that nobody would ever answer like how mm -hmm. so how do you find these, these investors and or how do these investors find out about you yeah and, and assuming that these these firms you know that you're mentioning don't have the same structure as us and to my knowledge no one really does my my sense would be that um when you would ask them if you could write a check they, they would bucket you into kind of that limited partners group um when we think about limited partners, like the, the check sizes that we're looking for are, are quite large. And I would say for most, you know, larger VC firms, even bigger than that. Yeah. Uh, I think that what we've identified is actually, frankly, sort of a solution for people like you who yeah. are pretty smart investors and would like exposure to startups, but, you know, want to write checks that are somewhere between $10,000 and $100,000, um, which, which is certainly smaller than what we would take for our, our limited partners in our fund, but is something that we are, are happy to facilitate on behalf of our venture partners. Um, should they be you know, helpful in the network and, and, and helpful finding us deals and be an active part of the community? Um, 
so you're you're sort of the, the problem that you just described I think is not unique um, and I think that what accounts for a lot of the fast growth yeah. has been that there are a lot of people like you um, who are interested in investing and being part of this community but are not like yet you know, your traditional limited partner for a VC or for a VC firm um, oh, okay. so so I think I think that you know we, we frankly have created a product for yeah. um, for sort of relatively young really inquisitive operators um, and, and I think that's that's you know the market that we're going after interesting so then with you then so like normally with the vcs you have to be an accredited investor which is like two hundred fifty thousand dollars of salary a year for like three years or a million dollars in assets is that the same with you do you have to be an accredited investor for what you're doing yeah so so okay. generally and and we've had some cases where uh, other investors want to check that every everyone's an accredited investor we've had other yeah. cases where you know they're not necessarily looking but but our venture partners are, are accredited investors and then just out of curiosity with that, how do they, do you just get that signed off by the accountant? Like who accredits, who actually certifies that you're an accredited investor? Yeah, my understanding of the law <laughs> is that we we need to either have them certify, have an investor certify to us that they're accredited um, or have reason to believe that they are. Um, reason to believe so my, 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 and, and again like I'm, I'm not a lawyer um, and, and my, my sense though is that it's not it's not particularly stringent but we're, we're pretty serious obviously about at least within our network kind of keeping that all buttoned up yeah that's a curious I mean maybe maybe you don't know but like what happens if somebody's given you money and then you find out that they shouldn't have been an accredited investor can that get ripped out of the fund I mean can that get taken back clawed back I guess I don't know, um, and I think I think fortunately I've never had a situation where I've had to deal with that either as an entrepreneur or as a VC. But yeah. um, you know, my my sense is certainly something to be careful about. Okay. So then, so then your your people they the um, they put in a thousand dollars, and then if there's something interesting to invest in, they invest in it. What's what's the lifespan of your um, or the life the life cycle? How long does does one of your funds last for, or is it by a fund, or what? How does that work out? Yeah, so so typically in in our space, like in VC, we're we're looking at a very long term asset. So okay. ideally, we're looking at something like a three x return over call it eight years. Okay. Uh, so you don't really know if you're good at this for a while. Um, <laughs> And I think I think that you know it moves slower because we're investing early in these companies. Yeah. Um, to the conversation we had earlier, like we don't want to be in a position where we have to uh, be at odds with the founder in terms of an exit opportunity. Like we'd like them to play out the best options for them as a founder, and over that kind of a, a, a life cycle, it, it tends to be what's best for us as well. Okay. Um, so generally, you know, call it seven to ten years, and if we can get a three X return on that, that's a very very good fund. So then, with your fund, is that is that a, that a grouping of companies you invest in, or is that per company? Because I've heard that's one of the problems: is if you get into some of these funds, like they 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 have a, a point where they have to sell everything, and so if you if you get in at the wrong time frame, your your startup can get screwed because the the, uh, the VC has, has to get out. I, I haven't heard about that, and unfortunately, I'm I'm not uh, can't really speak to to our fund um, as we're still raising it currently, but. Okay. Um, but, but generally in VC, you know, I, I think that in an early stage, if you're dealing with good, smart investors, then they're, they'll be upfront about kind of what they need. And, um, in my sense is that if, if you're talking to the types of investors you should be talking to, they would understand that like, you can't, you know, you can't put your startup in that kind of a position. Um, if you're later stage, if you're growth stage, like, you know, it, it's, it's more reasonable that they'll probably have terms that indicate that that's going to happen or not. Yeah. Um, but but generally, you know, it's again, it's important to read the terms and kind of get a sense of what you're getting into. So then, with you, because that's one of the things that comes up too, is these term sheets. And um, apparently, there's lots of different types of term sheets out there. Do you use some kind of standard? Because I I had heard out of Silicon Valley they were trying to standardize the term sheets. But are they standardized yet, or is it all across the board? Yeah, I, and I wouldn't anticipate that <laughs> you know, wouldn't. that's the kind of thing that that'll happen. I think I think is as, as long as you have competitive people. Um, looking for an edge term sheets are are a way to do that um, and I think you know th There are certainly things that you might expect to see and other things that you might not expect to see yeah. um, and, and there are red flags that you might want to ask about if, right. if you have them um, But we you know, we're, we're not actually generally we're not the ones creating the term sheet Typically, we're not a lead investor um, if we are then we end up creating the term sheet okay. uh, But it, it's, it's certainly something that we would walk away from if something doesn't look right to us yeah. um, 
one term, for instance, is very important to us is having pro rata rights. So we want the option uh, to maintain our ownership share uh, in future rounds. That's important to us because we're investing in long term health of these companies and we believe that they're going to be successful over a long period of time. So we'd like to maintain that, you know, ideally 10 percent. Um, ownership of the company. Um, that's important to us. That might not be as important to some other investors. Um, everyone sort of has their uh, their particular flavor. Um, yeah. I think that if you're an entrepreneur, um, you know, being careful about things like liquidity preference, like what happens if things go well or what happens if things go poorly, um, is is pretty key. Uh, and and then just sort of understanding kind of what information rights you're you're giving up. Like what are you promising uh, in terms of board seats? What are you promising in terms of um, of timing, uh, you know, are, are, are all the things that, that I think you should look at, but you're, you're, you'll know a dirty term sheet if you see one. Um, and, and generally you don't want to be in a position where you're having that negotiation. Are there any, are there any glaring red flags you've seen? Like, especially since you've done a startup before, like if you ever see this, just run, just fucking run. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, like, uh, yeah, no, I think, I think that, that where, 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 I guess the simplest place where people tend to make those plays is in, is in liquidity preference, right? So it's like, if you have two, three, four X, like ratcheted, like you're, yeah. you're, you're looking at some weird stuff. And, and I think that as an entrepreneur, that should be a little bit scary because, you know, all that does, it means that pretty much no matter what, you're not going to get what you put in, um, in terms of your effort and your time. Um, and, and again, you made this point earlier, I think smart investors know that like, that's not good for anybody because then you have demotivated people. So yeah. I, I would say more often than not dealing with the right kinds of people. If you, if you kind of surround yourself with the right types of investors, you end up, um, uh, aligning incentives very, very nicely. And I think that, that generally that ends up being the case. I, and, and I should say like, I, I did have a really, really good set of investors who, who were quite reasonable. And I think, um, you know, didn't have any disagreements about anything on the terms, but I was lucky. Um, and, and I, I think that there certainly was, was money that I walked away from, um, because it, it, it wasn't, it didn't make sense, um, in terms of evaluation for me and, and it would have handcuffed me. Yeah. I think that's another thing too, that that's probably important. I guess I would add is if it's an early round or maybe angel funding, yeah. um, you, you, you shouldn't only think about what this means for you as an entrepreneur, but what are future investors potentially going to think if they see really weird terms or they see someone who owns a weirdly large part of the company for like how uninvolved they are? Like that's there are some questions that will be had there and, and it just it makes the pie smaller for for the rest of us. So it's, it's important to kind of plan for the future. So then with the SEC rules, before you can go public, it used to be like you could have like 500 owners and now it's up to like 2,000. So when a VC invests, is, does the VC count as one owner? Yes. Okay. So, so even if you have 50 people paying into it, the VC is still just the, the one owner. To, to the best of my understanding, okay. yes. <laughs> to, the, to the best of my understanding. Oh, and, yeah, and I, I know some lawyers that, that I would definitely call first, but no, it's, it's in, in terms of like where it shows up on the cap table, even us, where we're aggregating funds from a number of different people, it's just going to say next gen once on yeah. the cap table. Yeah. Okay, that works. Um, so then, so you t we're talking about titles before, and that was one thing, like I went and I took a look at your, your org chart or whatever, and mm -hmm. you have, so you have directors, you have managing directors, you have managing partners, you have an associate, then you have like a random vice president. Like what, mm -hmm. what do these name? what do these title? like when I hear director or man, like, I think that's the top, but then you kind of got like a vice president over here. Like what do these yeah. titles actually mean? And your, your so this is an artifact of, of just like how our, how, how we're structured as a company where we do have a very robust group of people doing operational work on behalf of the portfolio companies. Okay. Um, so, so Lisa is, is our vice president. Um, yeah. um, she and I have actually worked together before yeah. all of this. So I know her pretty well. We went to school together. Uh, she's on the investment side. And so for her, you know, vice president is an appropriate title for kind of where she is on the investment team. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm her peer, but because I'm on the operational side, I'm, I'm a director. Um, so it's, it's just a, a way of us to signify to entrepreneurs that, you know, we don't just have kind of partners and vice presidents and associates yeah. like you would have in a typical investment firm, but we also have these, these people who are not investing, but operating in your behalf, like, like I am every day. And that's, that's sort of where, where our directors sit. Okay. So then what would be like the day? So you're a director. So what's the difference between like a director and a managing director? Uh, managing directors is, is kind of an investment title. Um, so those, those folks are more on the investment side, um, a little bit more senior, uh, 
a little bit, a little bit older. Uh, I guess they, they wouldn't like it if I said that, but, um, but I think, I think it's a weird sort of space for that in VC because you do see a lot of interesting things where like different firms have different structures. So it's certainly if you're, if you're looking to get into VC yeah. and you're kind of looking at people's titles, like I definitely wouldn't take it at face value. I think every firm is sort of different in how they're structured. And we, we might be one of the, one of the weirder ones to be honest with you, just, <laughs> just because we're so focused on doing that operational work. Okay. Um, so, so no, I, so I, I, I report directly to our chief operating officer because I'm, I'm sort of on the operating side yeah. and then the managing directors and uh, vice presidents associates sort of choose the investments for us okay and then down at the bottom rung I guess is an associate so what's an associate a uh, bit of a jack of all trades okay. um, certainly a, a relatively entry-level role I think that uh, Callum is our associates probably the, the the best example like poster boy for who could do really well at this kind of a thing yeah. um, young guy uh, really works hard, um, is out there sourcing deals, uh, is also helping me on the operational side. Um, so typically if you don't know anyone at the firm, um, and you're an entrepreneur who wants to pitch us, you, you're probably going to talk to him first. Hmm. Uh, and so it's tough to find people who know how to roll up their sleeves as well as he does and work as hard as he does. And are also smart enough to like actually do that first call and know if we should pass it on to, to a vice president or a managing director. So, um, it's, it's a really critical role. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a great way to learn a ton really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it tends to be, you know, more junior, but I think in, in VC, that's probably a good thing because you get to look at a lot of different stuff. So are they the first person you would run into? Cause I mean, that's one of the things, like I say, being, being older, is you run mm-hmm. into the associates and they they seem like kids a lot of them mm-hmm. and but are they are they are they kid are they the actual gatekeeper like for like somebody like me if I was interested in this would mm-hmm. I try to get your number or Callum's number I, I mean probably mine yeah, <laughs> um, okay. if you could and, and if, if you know you should probably be one of the managing directors before mine yeah, okay. um, so it's, and I think I think if you can get a partner like you're you're doing even better so you yeah. you go as high as you can but. You know, more often than not, you just and, and I experience this as an entrepreneur, obviously, like there are more often than not, you just don't know anybody at the firm. Yeah. Um, and so the first call, if you send some information in, if they're good enough to get back to you, and, and I think most are, mm-hmm. um, will probably be with someone like Callum. Okay. Um, you know, I, I would say that's that's I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like he, he's yeah. he's more well versed in our investment philosophy, certainly than I am, um, yeah. just given that he sits on that side. Yeah. Um, but a personal connection is always best. And I think that we source deals through all of our staff um, and all of our venture partner network as well. Yeah. So then how, how do you work your way up in the VC or how do you even get into it? Because like normally mm-hmm. when I deal with money people, they've either got the, the MBA or the law degree. Mm-hmm. Like that's just how it is or both of them or that yeah. and a couple of other things. Yeah. But like when I talk with VCs, you guys don't seem to have that kind of paperwork. Yeah. 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 It's sort of the, it's the wild west a little bit. And I think that's, you know, you're dealing with, with different, different asset class and like, yeah. you know, different, different groups of people. Um, it's funny. I, I joke like if, if we ever had an office where I had to wear kind of a suit every day, yeah. um, I would probably have to keep casual clothing at the office just to go meet with entrepreneurs. Cause like they don't take you seriously if you, <laughs> if you're dressed up like, like a finance guy. Um, so, so I think that the best, you know, piece of advice on how to get into VC, um, is my, my friend Ali Ahmed, uh, he actually started his own VC called CoVenture in New York. Really, really amazing guy. Um, he was one of my investors and one of the smartest investors I know. Uh, and his advice is just, just be insanely helpful. Um, and I think, I think that for all startup, um, activity, whether you want to be a lawyer, whether you want to be, um, an employee at a startup, if you want to found a company or work in VC, like it's, it's the, it's a place where going above and beyond to help other people with no expectation of anything in return does get rewarded. Um, and so I, I would say if you do that for long enough, um, there will be opportunities where you become invaluable. Um, and I think once that happens, you know, a role sort of occurs, uh, it's almost, almost like in spite of you, it's there. Um, so, so I think generally it's a good attitude to have. I think that it's something that we try to do at a, at a firm wide level and, and the people who I know who are the best VCs and really the best people in early stage companies in general have that kind of attitude and just hustle like you wouldn't believe, um, in ways that you wouldn't have thought of. So, do, but do you guys, do you get like stamps of approval from the SEC or again, like I say with normal money people, they've got all that paperwork on the wall with scribbles on it. Like just anybody, could I just say, Hey, I want to be a VC tomorrow. You could theoretically, you Dude, could, and really? I think, okay. you know, I think that a lot of that is just driven by the idea that like we're, we're not really doing complex financial analysis. Um, hmm. 
and and I think that generally, you know, if you can evaluate an investment opportunity at, at the startup level, that's certainly a different skill set than than in the public market for sure, and, and yeah. even at later stage private companies. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Cool. Then I guess that's one question too: is you came up with a whole thing like with how you dress. So even if you dressed formally, <laughs> you'd have to dress down. But it is it is curious in the startup world. Like if you don't dress the right way, people give you some really weird ass looks. So if you're a founder trying to get money. Yeah. Is it is it hoodie all the way? Like how how should you dress? I, I my strategy. This is not necessarily right, but my strategy has always been split the difference. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, like yeah. like this this can kind of be dressed up or dressed down. Yeah. <laughs> like so, like and I and I do I do keep like a blazer in the office if we have to meet with a lawyer or whatever. So I think I think like generally if you have some flexibility and versatility, you're going to be fine. I also can't code. If I could code, I could probably wear whatever I wanted, and <laughs> people would be okay with that. But I'm not I'm not a, I'm not an engineer. Yeah. Um. So I, I think I think the collar is appropriate for that reason. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then the other question I have is like, how how should founders act when they're trying to find you, or how do you think in the normal world? Because one of the things I've noticed is, I, I guess, with Steve Jobs' biography, everybody decided like the way to become successful is act like an asshole and you'll be a mil- millionaire. Um, do you is hyper confidence over ego i have the greatest thing in the world is that is that a good personality trait usually no um <laughs> i think you know the, the the exceptions are famous ones yeah. um yeah, yeah and and i think that uh you know your 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 jobsian kind of myth has, has certainly perpetuated some of these these ideas of what a founder should be like yeah. um my, my biggest thing is authenticity so if, if someone is actually deeply like that and they're they're totally in, like he was um and they really really have that kind of conviction and, and it shows through like yeah all right like that's fine um if that's who you are but if, if that's not you don't force yourself to be that way just be who you are and 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 you know it's it's like first grade advice right it's like just we can we can tell if you're kind of pushing in a direction that isn't truly who you are okay. um and we can tell if you're you're comfortable in your own skin yeah. um so i think i think that's that's probably the best advice i would give from kind of a personality perspective is just be yourself yeah, okay. yeah i was wondering because i I've, like i say i've actually seen that where the advice is given is you act all like and i'm like really right. yeah yeah um so then so i guess the next question is like how so how does somebody try try to meet with you or get in contact because we talk about like warmth obviously mm-hmm. you want your best friend to say hey this is a great company but if sure. you take that out of the equation like how would somebody try to contact you or try to get into the pipeline yeah no i think there's there's certainly like a hierarchy of of, of ways to do that and then at the top of course is the introduction yeah. um we we have a contact form on our website that we actually read um i oh, can't yeah. speak for other firms but if you <laughs> if you submit a deck um yeah. we will look at it uh you know that's not to say that that it'll go anywhere and it's not to say that it'll go as far as if you had had the right contact or we would look at it as hard i'm not sure yeah. um but but we, we we do pretty seriously look at everything that comes our way okay. um i think smart vcs do um so if you can if you can find an email address um i guess my recommendation would be to have a conversation first okay um and and maybe just you know pretty good advice is, is if, if you're looking for money ask for advice if you're looking for advice ask for money um <laughs> yeah. but at the same time you know keep in mind that like we do have to deploy our capital right and, like yeah. that's that's our job too um we need entrepreneurs as much as they need us and um we're always happy to talk with them we're not scary um and and we we probably the odds are we probably will say no um but generally there's a lot of reasons that that could happen and most of the time we still like you and i think it's a pretty good idea yeah. um so so I, I think that, you know, knowing our criteria as much as you can beforehand, having a conversation first and then progressing from there. And I think some really good advice from the Ask a VC event that, that you know, I wouldn't have thought of is, is to try to keep your fundraising timeline straight. So like you're you're having initial conversations with a group of investors at one point and then you're moving forward in the funnel in the same the same order with the different people. Now, do you. Do like VCs have any particular bars or something they go to? Like I, I, I tell my viewers back when I had a consulting shop, it was great. Some of the best advertising I did was while I was getting drunk. Like I'd go to a, <laughs> there's a place called Brewers Art, like back in the mid 2000s, where you would go there and you drink five or six beers and you would ba- I would basically get hired. You just sit there. Yeah. And it was all entrepreneurs and business people. So they're like, what do you do? I do uh, I run a I run a computer repair company. They're like, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. like. And so I'd say that's one of the best ways to meet people. Um, are there bar like do VCs hang out at bars and happy hours or social events? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the unfortunate things at this stage around kind of like DC is is it's not a big enough community yet where there are. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say if, if we were in Silicon Valley, I, I probably would know. Yeah, um, okay. But but I think I think for us, it's just there's there's not that many VCs here yet. Um, I, I think that, that that sort of a culture eventually develops. And and I guess the one thing I will say is maybe as a nice substitute for that, if you if anyone ever reaches out to me and wants to grab a beer or a coffee and like talk about stuff, like I'm I'm more than happy. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs who we haven't invested in who I definitely stay in touch with because I like them and I like their idea and and we, you know, have a vested interest in keeping that relationship going. So, um, so again, you know, I, I don't know that there's anywhere I could tell you to kind of post up and <laughs> like hang out and wait for us, but, uh, but we're happy to happy to chat if we have time. Oh, cool. So you guys, you're, you're in DC. Yeah. So do you know, like, like one of the interesting things I've been finding is, Northern Virginia, honestly, seems to be where, like, all the really cool stuff is. But then you have, like, people in D.C. Do you know, like, why you would pick Washington, D.C. over, like, Northern Virginia? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's there's a good arguments for both. I think I think we're starting to see more startups in D.C. proper that are interesting. We invest nationally, so um, we do have investments uh, in D.C. We do have investments in Northern Virginia. Um, we also have investments in L.A., Austin, Boston. Okay. Um so, uh, so all that is to say that that you know I think both of those places are 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 good tech communities. And Northern Virginia has a bit of a different flavor in terms of the types of companies that come out of there. Yeah. Um, but definitely some talent in this area for sure. And I think we we look pretty hard at companies in both regions. So, but is there any tax benefit, right? Because what what a lot of people, if if you're not in the area, you don't realize like literally Virginia, D.C., and Maryland can all be within a mile distance. Right. Right. So is there like literally a you know, is there is there yeah. a business reason to be in one place or another? I've I've read more about um, incentives for Virginia. Um, I think there are incentives that exist for uh, a lot of different places. I'm I'm originally from from Buffalo, New York, and I know that there's incentives there as well um, yeah. to to move your company. And, and and I think I think that a lot of different municipalities are looking at that. Um, but I've read most about, you know, companies that might move to Arlington from DC. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that's universally the case. It obviously depends on the number of employees and, you know, any sort of tax benefits. Are you making a profit anyway that you could you could make money from your tax benefits? So I think it's 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 interesting to think about your particular company for sure. Yeah, okay. So I guess in your shoes, like why why did you pick DC? Um Personally, so I came here. Uh, I came here a little more than a year and a half ago okay. um, to work at a, at a startup, which ended up becoming my own company. Um, okay. I did that until this past March. Unfortunately, we had to to wind that down, uh-huh. um, and then I stuck around here at, at NextGen. So I I love DC. I like living here a lot personally. Yeah. Um, I think that it's a growing tech community. I like to say that I think the talent here is is very very good. It's just there's not as much of it yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so no, I'm I'm happy here. I think it's it's uh, the right side community to do some pretty cool things in the tech space and, and I think it's uh, an interesting place over the next few years that'll that'll really start to grow okay. then how long has next gen been around for so next gen was initially next gen angels um, okay. it was a network of angel investors and that's really been sort of three or four years yeah. um, and then next gen venture partners we sort of about a year ago we uh, I guess in the beginning of, of 2016 um, is when that started yeah. Well, I've actually burned through all of my questions. So I guess the the big question for my my viewers would be, so being in your shoes, what what do you think is the the new technology to get into? Like what if if you were 18 again, I don't know, you seem yeah. pretty young, but you know, if you're a young guy again, <laughs> a little while ago, yeah. <laughs> you're going to you're going to target something. What what would you target right now? Um, I, I think that, and this is not an original idea by any means, but I, th- I think that bots are, are sort of the new apps um, in a lot of ways. Not I think really. that you like bots. Yeah, I, th- I think really? that there's a really interesting business applications um, for for bots, and I, I'm curious to see what starts to happen yeah. uh, over the next ten years as more and more tasks are sort of um, outsourced in that way. Like I, I do my meeting scheduling now through through a bot. Um, I think that. You know, I think there's a lot of interesting, and, and certainly it's not all the way there yet, but I'm starting to see the fog lift a little bit where you can see some things that we might have needed a person to do before. So if I, if I was 18, yeah. um, I think learning how to work uh, within that kind of tech stack would be really interesting, just like learning to be an app developer maybe, you know, 10, 15 years ago would have been. Yeah, because I've been hearing a lot about stuff about the bots, but I just keep looking. And I'm just like, eh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's, it's not, me. It's not just, quite there. I think yeah, you're right, yeah. but 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 I think that you know, I guess I guess I've seen sort of an uptick in progress and usability yeah. um, in a lot of ways over the over the last year or two. Oh, cool. 
So I guess that's about it. Is there, are there any final thoughts you'd have for the, the, the viewers at home about VC, your startup, or any, anything like that? I mean, it's, it's, it's a really interesting kind of rapidly evolving space. I think it's a, a cool way to interact with interesting companies. And, and yeah, I would, you know, if, if you're interested, like I said, just being insanely helpful is the, the, the way to go. So. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time and I uh, really you. appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah.